So greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Payne coming to you from the NISA Center, or actually remotely from my own home on behalf of the NISA Center. This is the, I believe, 11th uh, iteration of NISA's Maritime Digital Series that has taken place during this pandemic era. Um, we are joined today to, uh, by Vice Admiral Pradeep Chahan, uh, Executive Director of the National Maritime Foundation, former senior officer of the Indian Navy, uh, experienced in every component of the maritime domain from traditional naval operations to non-traditional security concerns to multilateral engagement uh, and multilateral cooperation. He's an old friend of, my, of mine as well as nieces. Um, and the conversation for today is on holistic security in the Indian Ocean. Essentially, how do we get beyond the niche uh, specializations that tend to define how maritime operations and maritime security are pursued and start having a comprehensive vision of securing the Indian Ocean for all, not only all the littoral states, uh, but for all commercial actors, seafarers, sailors, um, and non-regional actors that are involved in that area. And this will function as a conversation. So I will begin with a question to the Vice Admiral for his response. And from there, we will, uh, we will develop um, the complexity and the detail of the conversation thereafter. So before I kick off, I just wanted to personally thank the Vice Admiral for taking time out of his schedule. Uh, it is early in the morning here in D.C., but it is in the evening in Delhi, so we are making this digital uh, reality workforce. So again, sir, on behalf of myself and Nisa, to you, thank you for taking the time. And the first question that I had for you uh, seemingly is a simple question, but there's a lot of hiccups involved in examining it, and it's this. How should maritime security in the Indian Ocean be conceived? A seemingly a straightforward issue, but not so easy when you get into the details. So, sir, to you for your response. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me, uh, conversation with me. Uh, one small correction that I would like to make, since this will go out to a number of uh, stakeholders, uh, both yours and mine. Uh, I am actually, my correct designation is the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation. The Executive Director is a more competent gentleman than me. That is uh, Captain Sarabjit Parmar. That having been got out of the way, uh, let me once again say thank you and then launch into the question, the answer to the question, which, as you say, is somewhat deceptively simple. Actually, the most difficult questions are always the simple ones, uh, aren't they? So I, I, I think I would like to begin by saying that traditionally, of course, uh, you know, security uh, was uh, thought of only in terms of uh, the defense of sort of territory uh, where militaries uh, vied and jostled with one another for, um, for superiority within a state system that really was, uh, was characterized by anarchy uh, in terms of there's nobody, no mommy and no daddy to turn to and you have to sort things out by yourselves. So there was this incessant competition for military superiority with other nation states. But as the, uh, as the years have gone by, I think more and more governments, certainly the government of India, uh, and I dare say uh, that's in common with many governments, uh, recognizes that there are several dimensions to, uh, to uh, security. And of these various dimensions, the military dimension is just one. Now, it's, it's true uh, that that's probably the most important one. It's true that uh, uh, there are, that it, it, it is true that it is, uh, let's say, um, primus into Paris, but it's nevertheless just the one. Other issues such as political dimensions of security, environmental dimensions, the societal dimensions, the economic dimensions, and even, even more um, esoteric sounding versions where, uh, you know, do you trust your government? Does your government trust you? Uh, contribute to either security or the lack of it. And in many cases around the world, and especially in the uh, Indo-Pacific and uh, its subdivisions between the Western Pacific and uh, the Indian Ocean, I think these are germane questions to be asked, including the last one. So 
The way that I would like to address security is by first saying that we need to use the adjective that you correctly used in the beginning, which is holistic. We cannot be looking at security through narrow stovepipes of any given dimension of security. It would be imprudent to say the least. So yeah, there is, as I said, uh, a number of dimensions that we need to take into account altogether. Now, let me quickly drill down uh, before handing over my to you, drill down to the point of, uh, of uh, maritime security. So just as I said that security is more than military security, Maritime security is more than the Coast Guard Navy amalgam. And maritime security in India has actually been defined right at the prime ministerial level where Prime Minister, erstwhile Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh said that maritime security is freedom from threats arising either in the sea or from the sea or through the sea, no matter their cause, no matter their origin, and however they manifest themselves. So. Obviously, we have a set of man-made uh, uh, threats arising in or from or through the sea. Uh, they can be traditional ones. They can be non-traditional ones. Then there, there are a bunch of uh, natural uh, calamities and threats, which also impose costs upon nation states and their maritime structures. And of course, you have combinations, the most classic of which is uh, climate change itself. So I think this is the this is the framework within which we ought to look at um, maritime security, and it's extraordinarily dangerous to try and call these pillars. I I, I really have uh, have have garnered a great deal of dislike for the word pillars because it automatically implies that there are some vertical stovepipes within which we can happily conduct these conversations, and actually everything is linked to everything else, and so it's more like a like a like a, uh, that we must uh, conceive of with lots and lots of transitions on the horizontal between these various uh, supposed um, verticals. I'd stop there. Um, and uh, my apologies, um, Director General, um, I, I, forgive me for that. I blame the early morning and the lack of caffeine uh, inserted directly into my veins. Um, but the uh, let me let me do a follow up because you know I I, I use the term holistic security because I directly stole it from you. Um, in previous conversations that we've had, but um, you, let's start with the, what you said at the very end. Um, you don't like the concept of pillars because it's it implies a stovepiping, it implies silos that bureaucracies and security systems inherently love to create. So, give me, give in your experience, give me some practical examples of how we can break down those barriers. Um, that 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 seems to be something that we I think would be an interesting follow up, sir, to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to, yeah, well, why not? Very recently at the, four, at the, at the uh, 2019 version of edition of, 2019 edition of the, uh, of the East Asia Summit, uh, the Prime Minister of India actually had a fairly novel concept. And this is not about Sagar, which of course is the vision that India has for the, uh, for the uh, region, which is, security and growth for all in the region, that's, uh, that's a vision. That's a conceptual level sort of statement. But we need something more specific to be able to move that vision across from the conceptual level to the execution level. And we need to make sure that everybody owns some part or all of it. And so he initiated he uh, the Indo-Pacific Open Initiative or the IPOI. And as you know, in this area, we're getting a fairly substantive uh, alphabet uh, soup in which we must, uh, through which we must wade. So here's another one, it's IPOI, the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative. And now this one has indeed got uh, several uh, spokes, seven of them. One of them is military security. Another one is science and technology. A third one is uh, environment and the ecology. Uh, a fourth one might, and so on and so forth. And what we're trying to do with these uh, is to actually say that, hi, so we've got, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've got uh, lawfare. We've got to understand law. We've got to understand international, uh, the applications and the use and the abuse of uh, international law, uh, which we are seeing in our, in our region. 
uh, we need to have some structures for connectivity. So let me talk about some of these and tell you how they can be actually stitched together in these plans. We, every nation has got an option. It can either pass on prescriptive measures and hope that people will just fall in line. And militaries love this. Bureaucracies, as you correctly say, actually, whether uniformed or outside of uniform, love pillars, love stovepipes, because many things can be pushed or dropped into the cracks that fall that lie between those various uh, pillars. So, uh, if we take if we take uh, a nation's options, as I said, you can be like uh, some nations and say, "I've got a BRI, join it, or stay out forever." You can be uh, different, and you can say, "Hi." So uh, this is an or concept in which uh, we would be happy to take the lead on something. In, in the case of the IPOI, I think India would like to take the lead on precisely holistic maritime security. But uh, we appreciate that there will be other leads that are required and uh, other countries that are better placed to uh, take those particular leads. And so uh, in terms of maritime uh, ecology or uh, pollution of the oceans. For example, just as an example, Australia has a huge lead in which they have done some really sterling work in the business of pollution. You might think that pollution doesn't affect or afflict us, but I can assure you that having been out to sea in some of these polluted areas, you can have main propellers or you can have submarine intakes fouled by plastics. And everybody who has been to sea in this age and day uh, will vouch for that. So, so do we have the ability to stovepipe military security away from oceanic pollution, plastic debris? No, we don't. If we, if we continue to have issues of improving our maritime trade by increasing the number of merchant ships, as is presently the case, then don't those merchant ships keep having keep generating low and medium frequency noise, doesn't that degrade not just the military acoustic environment, but the marine acoustic environment and the marine acoustic habitat? Then do we not have whale strandings? Do we not have increases of mammal strandings? If we're going to concentrate upon military issues such as the reliable acoustic path, then are we the only users of the reliable acoustic path duct? And therefore, in what manner ought we to be able to merge and balance these? And we won't be able to do this unless we talk to each other about all these issues simultaneously. So trade and uh, maritime connectivity can hardly be uh, stovepiped away from, let's say, maritime resources. If you if you start to harness these resources, we must have a chat about how it's to be done. There must be some detailed work and some detailed study. If we're going to try and do capacity building, then we need to take into account capability enhancement. And this obsession of navies, of militaries, of countries increasingly being focused only upon science, technology, engineering, mathematics is is to my mind, at least, I cannot caution against this strongly enough. We need to be informed by the social sciences. Where are those people? Where are those inputs that will drive our thinking? Even within military concepts, even within military constructs, even within maritime military traditional security, uh, what is the role of face? Is face the same as respect? Is face the same as uh, honor? our honor and face it or not. These are really important factors that we deal with ascendant powers that are so uh, taken, so obsessed by their own speed of ascendance that they have actually decided to subvert pretty much everything to the single goal of rising. So how do I do this? Uh, how do we actually put this into practice? First thing is the role of academic think tanks. This, you know, very few countries in the world, Jeffrey, have actually the ability for their track one to know how to leverage track two. In far too many cases, the relationship between a track one and a track 1.5 or a track two is simply one of mutual loathing. 
It's so. One, one likes to tell the other guys, why don't you finally read up? And the other guys are trying to tell the guys who are in service, listen, we've made these mistakes before. You make new ones. Don't make the same ones. And therefore, the role of think tanks, the role of institutions, academia, can hardly be overemphasized by me. That is the start point, because you have, you have credibility within your country's systems, and I have credibility, or my institution has them within mine. And if we talk to each other, then this credibility can be leveraged to mutual benefit. So there are, that's the first step. Then exercises, military to military conversations. Are we doing enough? Are all our exercises simply geared towards the sexy end, I might use that word, uh, in these somewhat more puritanical times uh, that we find ourselves? Is, is, is it all about how many Malabars can we do? Or isn't it also about what else can we do? How do we build capabilities? Should we always end up in various boxes where we are saying, give me your black box, and you are saying, give me yours? Isn't there a way of getting the people, the militaries, connected on these issues? Today, we've moved across in trying to detect. I keep moving this to the military simply because I am fundamentally a, a military trained officer, and I hope that the training uh, has been a good one. So if I'm going to look at your uh, or, or Chinese movement of, uh, let's say, nuclear-powered submarines into the Indian Ocean, then I need to get involved. I need to get involved in geography. I need to get involved in geopolitics. I need to get involved in science. I need to get involved in this whole business of moving from drapes to traps to to dash and to all the acronyms that uh, you know emerge from various military scientific establishments with such regularity, then I need to internalize that. Then I need to be able to contextualize it to my system, my situation. If we've got a natural disaster, a humanitarian uh, assistance and disaster relief uh, paradigm, don't we need to understand climate change? If climate change is to be studied by us within these various folks that I mentioned, then do we not end up in lawfare? Let's say the Maldives disappears tomorrow or at the end of the century. What happens to the exclusive economic zone of the Maldives? Where does it go? Who's, whose does it become? If all the Maldivians disappear, what happens to that? Who is wrestling with these issues, which are military issues, finally? And what arguments would we pose when we come before various arbitration mechanisms if we haven't done enough homework beforehand? We'll be forced into, into knee-jerk kind of reactions, and they don't lead to any good place, as you probably are aware. So let me pause here and hand the mic over back to you. Um, thank you, sir. I, I had another question in the in in the, the chamber, so to speak, but I'm going to delay it um, to ask you a, a follow-up. Um, it seems to me what you're getting at is that, uh, sticking with the theme of, of navies and military structures, that um, nations need to do a better job at mixing what in kind of the U.S. context would be the tactical, operational, and the strategic. There seems to be a delay in the strategic conception of how Part A is connected to Part C, that's connected to Part W, um, until you reach a certain rank um, or, or have a certain amount of experience underneath your, your feet. Um, and we can argue about how the United States or, or India or Australia does this, but what about inside the Indian Ocean region, the countries that do not have the same level of depth and, and kind of resourcing? Um, that say India does um, is is it the same is it the same struggle for a country say like the Seychelles or Mauritius um, that have far more limited uh, baseline uh, capabilities to start with um, than say India when it comes to struggling with this or um, is that completely the wrong mindset? Are countries like that actually better attuned to thinking in a nimble, strategic, interconnected way? 
Um, what is your what is your thinking there? Okay, so that's a really good uh, question, and I really like the last bit. But let me uh, let me break it down a little bit. Uh, I mean, nimbleness and agility and dexterity are uh, are survival skills, especially if you aren't one of the big ponderous uh, sort of creatures. And ponderosity is a is a uh, death wish for countries that don't uh, don't become nimble and don't become dexterous. So there you go. Now uh, let me break that down once again. So um, if we take smaller countries, we need to make a clear distinction at our levels uh, between these two words, capacity and capability, that we tend to mix up all the time. We tend to, uh, you know, militaries uh, in particular tend to be impatient with anything that isn't actually following bouncing ball. And as a consequence, we miss out on those uh, on the other structures that are actually far more important. Now your question is, does that come with a certain rank, a certain experience, a certain age? I reckon it does, yes, but uh, uh, we can hardly say that any one country has a lane on either aging or uh, maturing or gaining more and more experience. So it, it would be, I think, uh, condescending were we to actually believe that to be true. What we need to understand is that nations require capacity and they require capability where capacity is material wherewithal and capability is the human resource that can be brought to bear to leverage that available or existing or desired or aspirational capacity. So you don't have a patrol boat. I give you a patrol boat. I have doubled your capacity. So do you have a do you have a training infrastructure? Do you have a uh, a logistic maintenance cycle? Do you know how to make an operational come refit uh, movement cycle? Do you have a lifetime costing mechanism? Do you have a, a, a legal framework? Yes, 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 and yes. Wow, you have capability, baby. No, 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 and no, you only have a liability. Now, between these two, assume that you had to prioritize one. Which one would you prioritize? It depends on which country you come from. So if your country is a country which has a surfeit of capacity, then you will tend to throw capacity at a problem. You will say, give them another couple of boats, give them another aircraft, give them another something. We in, in the Indian Ocean region are conscious of the fact that what we need to build is capability because that's our strong suit. That's the card that we hold, and that's the one that we must throw. Now, between the two, which one works better? So let's take, you gave Mauritius as an example, uh, as just a passing example, and I don't want to concentrate upon any given country, but you know that Mauritius recently suffered this dreadful case of having a grounding by a Japanese ship off one of their coral reefs and endangering the ecology there. Then, they, so there was, some there was some capacity available, but there wasn't enough evidence of capability. Then, we recently, in the last couple of days, have seen that they had a dual, that means a double whammy. Now they got all the fuel off that ship, put it into a fuel barge, had it towed by a tug, and then the tug collided with the barge and ended up sinking. Now, we have a clear case, once again, of saying that, hi, Maybe we need to develop capabilities. You don't like this example, and I'm sure that I don't want to dwell on it. I'm in love with Mauritius. I spent three years of my life there. And as far as I'm concerned, Mauritius can do no wrong. OK, that having been said, uh, Seychelles, for instance, if you need to develop any of these countries, Somalia, let's take Somalia. We don't talk about Somalia, perhaps because it doesn't fit into the Indo-Pacific western extremity of the US, but it certainly fits into the Indian Ocean region. There's no doubt about that. So if we take Somalia and we, we see what happened to the fisheries, why did that happen? Because these countries don't have the capability all the time, nor do we. It's, I'm not speaking to some holier than thou pulpit. I'm trying to say that when you are able to understand some fancy legal mumbo jumbo which says that I will grant you rights to fish in my exclusive economic zone 
provided you pay me X amount of money per catch, per unit catch of fish. Am I happy? I guess so. Should I be happy? Certainly not, because you haven't figured out how to read the fisheries agreement. What will be the impact of that particular agreement on long term, medium term, short term, even immediate term migratory stocks? What will happen to the tuna? What will happen to these in intensely migratory species when they start getting fish and they change in order to make a survival? bid as a species, they start to change their migratory path. Then when I do have the capacity, I won't have the damned fish. So we need to build capability, capability development. If you teach a guy how to fish, you remain his best friend rather than simply making him dependent upon the fish that you provide him to eat. I know this is a hackneyed uh, you know, sort of um, cliched comment, but nevertheless, it is true. So I'm saying this, even if you look at big countries like China, look at how the Chinese Navy actually developed. What did they develop first? They first developed capability. Then they began to develop capacity. Then they got seduced by capacity. And now they've got capacity running ahead of their capability. Because capability is not just how to deploy, but whether to deploy, where to deploy, when to deploy, in what manner to deploy. I think that uh, you would appreciate what I'm trying to get at, that if you had to prioritize, if America was to, the United States was to be really meaningful as a partner to India, then India must exchange on equal footing issues of capability to the USA. If they have to sing in the immediate term, then whoever has capacity must bring capacity. Whoever has capability must bring capability to the table. Finally, I want to make one more point that this business, this word of interoperability, if you talk to naval officers like me, by and large, they will talk to you about technical interoperability, communications, interoperability. But let's take the case of a tsunami or, a, or some other disaster relief operation. Okay, so. Uh, I brought the blankets and you brought the blankets. Who brought the tents? Who was supposed to bring the tents? How did we get interoperable? How should we get interoperable? If my boat packs up in the water, can you pick up my boat? Can I pick up yours? Even if we can't communicate on the fanciest of, uh, of uh, communication sets, but we can do basic communication. Capability, all the time our effort should be to maximize capacity, I am at no stage saying that we don't need capacity. I am trying to emphasize that within the priority structure, you need capability first. Thank you. Sir, that, that makes sense to me. And I mean, I, I, I personally share your bias there. Um, and yes, you, the US is one of the countries that is very guilty of, of being casual with the separation, but um, I think the issue for the US is that um, we do follow the shiny objects that we create in bulk. And, uh, and, and honestly, a lot of the requests that are received by the United States, um, especially in the maritime domain, is not training or the human capabilities um, that the United States possesses, but a request for stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, honestly, there has been a, a, a transformation on the U.S. side of recognizing that providing the stuff uh, is often not the solution. In fact, it might be uh, make the illness um, worse. Um, but following up with that, um, you were you, you brought up a point regarding Somalia and it being part of the Indian Ocean. Um, one of the, the issues, and this is a, a bias from, I think, from a non-Indian Ocean region um, country. Um, obviously, China has, a, has an increasing stake in the Indian Ocean. The United States has a long-standing stake in the Indian Ocean. European powers have a substantial stake. Japan, Korea, um, pretty much all uh, countries integrated into the global economy um, are interested in some way, shape, or form in the Indian Ocean. The issue is that um, there seems to be, an, and do you think there is, in terms of the maritime understanding, a lack of appreciation for the Indian Ocean being connective tissue for the littoral states of the Indian Ocean rim. 
Um, and I bring like South Asia clearly understands and sees itself as it relates to the Indian Ocean. Um, you see this in official documents. You see this in the structure of militaries. You see this in the structure of the economies. But if you go to certain parts of East Africa, or especially, I think, in the Middle East, there is not this same understanding that the economic well-being and the kind of political um, understanding of, 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 of a regional identity is not connected to the Indian Ocean. Um, it's either seen in a localized way or it's, it's independently defined. Um, do you think that addressing some of the challenges you brought up, everything from environmental issues to greater interoperability to the information sharing on a basic level, uh, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. Do, do these separate identities within the Indian Ocean Rim, um, do you think they really exist or is this my misunderstanding? And if they do, how do we overcome those? Yeah, so uh, once again, a brilliant question. Um, you clearly have me on my toes all the all, all, all uh, evening, but uh, let me let me once again address this. There are several levels along which these need to be addressed. It's not that we could; we need to. One of them is uh, the first part where you said that you know the United States uh, tends to um, be asked for stuff, and stuff then uh, can go in any given uh, direction, mostly in unexpected ones. But let me uh, let me put it differently. Suppose the United States has partnerships running currently and building currently with countries. At least with India, we have an extremely strong, durable. I would like to think durable partnership, and it needs to be based on as many touch points as is possible, so that its in its durability is enhanced. Now. Suppose you have capacity and I have regionally sensitive capability. Would it not make sense for us to partner in that way? Would it make more sense, do you think, that we should compete uh, for, the, for the attentions of a given state when we could partner and make sure that, A, our partnership in, is enhanced, is strengthened, and uh, the states concerned that the, uh, which are being addressed are benefited? I would think yes. So now from there, let me jump to the second element of your, uh, of your question, which is uh, how do we handle local centricity? That means how do, you, how do you handle, is it true? Yeah, it's pretty much true. So what do we do? Well, one of the things that we did and which we would like to see grow strongly is that we created the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and then we we're bending over backwards to make sure that this isn't looked at as an Indian uh, construct. The Indian Navy simply took the lead. In order to make sure that that didn't become a, 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 an Indian sort of, um, you know, control mechanism, we, we undertook a grouping of the countries of IONS, IONS being the acronym for the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. And then we said, all right, there are clearly completely different uh, challenges that lie in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the case of um, West Asia and this area, South Asia, Southeast Asia and Australia, and then East Africa. So we said, all right, let's do the following really dangerous things. Let's not keep control over the secretariat. Let's hand over the, not only the chairmanship, but the secretariat itself every two years and move it in sequence for one of the countries of that region so that in those two years, the organization as a whole will start to pay attention to the peculiarities of that particular area and its security challenges. And then if we can do this frequently enough, if we mature this organizational structure in this manner, yeah, sometimes there'll be a lemon. Sometimes there'll be some guy who isn't, uh, you know, with it. Okay. That's, that's part of the cost of making sure that it is inclusive. And will we lose time? Yep, we will lose time while that lame duck has to be endured. But not everybody's going to be a lame duck. And not every non lame duck has to be a powerful country. Many are powerful is the, in the conventional sense. Remember, sir, every single country in the Indian Ocean has niche capabilities in some area. 
Let me give you an example of just uh, Sri Lanka, which is the country, in your opinion, that has the most experience, the most expertise dealing with violent maritime non-state or state-sponsored actors. It is Sri Lanka. Neither you as the United States of America nor we as India have even a fraction of their experience. And therefore, when we look at them, we ought not to look at them by way of size or by way of uh, the fact that in, in, in area of operation A or B, we are superior. We're not superior. We just have some local niche capabilities of our own, and they can be exchanged with niche capabilities of that target or that particular partner nation. So if India is hell-bent on building frigates, we also have a, 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 a territorial integrity problem uh, rising from the seas, and you all know about the Mumbai uh, depredations that were visited upon us. So we obviously we need to build large numbers of these um, high-speed patrol boats that can handle harbor security and close coastal security. Where do we go? Well, we can go to the UAE or we can go to uh, Oman and say, hi, you guys are really good because you make these fantastic, um, you know, deep sea fishing vessels and you make these really upmarket luxury high speed yachts. Can you not do this for us? And we'll make this and we'll probably, you know, work some partnership out with you on that. And you make this. When we now talk specifically about countries that are dealing with Somalia and those kind of issues in your question about why aren't people in those areas more forthcoming in saying, okay, this is my area and this is the Indian Ocean as a whole. This is because inside those countries, countries like us, countries like India, haven't been able to leverage our evangelical powers sufficiently so that we can evangelize the movement, that we can energize the movement. When, when a movement goes to a country that wishes to do something, it gets done. And it doesn't matter which area, it doesn't matter whether it's East Africa, it's Australasia, it's, um, it's, uh, it's um, Southeast Asia, it's South Asia, it doesn't matter. If you tell, a if a country desires that it must prove itself, it will. If it desires not to need to prove itself, and it can be goaded to do so. It can be convinced to do so. That requires evangelism. That requires advocacy. Making a bad news story news, it takes no effort. I mean, you don't have to do anything. But making a good story into news takes effort. And that's how you make out whether this guy is a good journalist or he's just a bum. And likewise, when I say that the Indian Ocean has we would be foolish to say that the Indian Ocean has pan-oceanic problems alone. Yes, it does have those. And yes, some of the local problems are solved by pan-regional problems such as maritime domain awareness sharing. And then when we might have, India might have a, 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 um, the ability, the capacity and the capability to create such a pan-regional structure such as the IFC IOR, that is the Information Fusion Center for the Indian Ocean region, then it is up to us to say, hi, we're not limited to the Indian Ocean. Come and join. And if, you, if you're nervous about that, don't worry. We will teach you. We will partner you. We will not teach you that, you know, you're the slow kid on the block. No. We think that we need you. And we cannot do without any of these people. Maritime domain awareness, therefore, currently is driving India to a closer cooperation with Cremario, which is an EU uh, you know, sort of setup, to uh, the Indian Ocean Commission, which is very much EU, France, and Mauritius pushed to Singapore's IFC, which is very much Singapore, to Madagascar, which has got part of the information sharing mechanisms going across to the United States, to uh, the Mediterranean, and it's only then that, that, you know, that very unfortunate timing of Admiral Mike Mullen's really brilliant concept of a thousand ship Navy was immediately picked up by linguistic infirmities as, oh, we're looking at a huge US fleet. No, 
And whose fault was it? Madison Avenue's fault. Because they picked up this thing that had a ring to it and they never bothered to explain it. There was no effort made to understand that the American turn of phrase may not find uniform reflection in other parts of the Indian Ocean. It could have worked. It just needed capability and evangelism. And therefore, if we want to address the problems of Somalia and we want to get countries from uh, the poorest to the richest involved in this, we need to do some things differently. Let's say that I bring the Indian Navy. The Indian Navy in any case is going to the assistance of the Maldives because the Maldives has a water shortage because their water desalination plant packed up. Okay, so when I go there, I'm going there anyway. I'm now going to go there bilaterally. But what stopped me from going there and saying, hi, I've come here in accordance with the principles of the ions. And what stopped me from picking up some uh, somebody from the Moldavian Defense Force? It doesn't matter who. It doesn't matter if it's not the admiral. It doesn't matter if it's the gardener, the plumber, somebody, the painter's assistant. Call him to your party. Make much of it. Say, hi, this is, an, and here are our partners, and they're represented so well by Mr. A, B, and don't, don't make out that he is um, not exactly your first choice, if at all he isn't. But when you do that, I can bet my bottom dollar that Seychelles will come upon its own self and say, hey, what about us? Why aren't we in that party? That's how you build the situation. That's how you build it. But to build it, one ingredient is critical, and that is passion. You have to be passionate about the fact that you want to build this. Generating passion is hard, but hard is what big nations are supposed to do. Not easy. Easy stuff, like I said, you don't need the journalist. You need a journalist when the story has to be made to be sold. I don't know whether that makes enough sense to you, but uh, I, 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 that's how, how best I can put it. Yes, sir. Uh, this actually... It makes complete sense. It's a it's the same kind of puzzle that that honestly we work on at NISA, um, in a different context I think, but uh, that I think too many uh, voices here in Washington chase the journalist versus vice versa, where the journalist should be chasing those who are developing these deeper relations. Um, and I think it often comes up in the relationship to uh, competition with with other major powers that China takes one baby step forward in some place and there's pomp and circumstance all over. There's ribbons, there's, there's flowers coming from the sky where, you know, substantial infrastructure and partnerships that have been developed by the United States or France or India over decades are, are not even factored in. People like forget they even exist. And so um, I think there's a little bit of, uh, of trying to navigate that, but let me, let me switch it away from the military kind of official sphere. Um, let's make it smaller. Because one of the things that I find fascinating about maritime conversations, and specifically your idea of holistic security, is that not only are you thinking about global, regional, uh, interagency within governments, um, you know, in a, in a specific subsection like, you know, the Bay of Bengal or the Arabian Sea or the, uh, or, or the uh, Mozambique Channel or whatever it is, but you're also thinking about, like, getting all the way down to the local sense, to, into coastal communities. Um, do you think, and, and this is based upon my own ignorance, um, and it's something I'm interested in knowing, do you think that coastal communities are integrated into conversations about maritime security effectively enough? Um, or does it depend on what country you're talking about? Or is it just because the modern kind of, mechanisms of the state um, will disregard that local knowledge, that local insight, that local impact. Um, so what are your reactions there, sir? Um, everything, every part of my answer is functional upon the, uh, the agreement that we might subliminally at least have on w when you say, are they involved in the conversations on maritime security? Once again, we come to what then is maritime security. So uh, that is the big sort of uh, peace that we ignore at our great peril uh, if we're going to drill down from the points that you mentioned that means the sublime all the way down to the local i'm hesitant to use the normal phrase of ridiculous 
because it certainly isn't that. So when you go down, are coastal communities involved in the discussions that take place of maritime security holistically considered? If you look at it from the perspective of a capital of a major city, a state or a country, the answer will be no. But let's take cases where they do have to be involved. Let's take cases where we talk about the maritime security impact of climate change. Then you need to, and we do involve the locals because they're the only ones who know whether we should do what mitigation or what adaptive strategies we should follow. Should we advance? Should we retreat our structures? Should we raise structures? Should we make walls? And if a local grouping, let's say, says that we, you know, we're in danger, of, I'm just going to give you a couple of uh, maybe disconnected or only loosely connected uh, examples. But let's say that uh, the Maldives at one point in time uh, fearful of an existential threat being posed by sea level rise, try to look at the option of simply increasing the heights of their islands, the elevation of the islands. And it seemed at the local level to be a really good idea. And then at the geopolitical level, we had China coming in and saying, hi, we're the world's experts about from in making islands out of nothing. And so the local communities now began to get involved in a geopolitical discussion simply because there had to be some other alternatives available to them rather than this one. OK, let me give you a more focused example. When you take fisheries and you take the problems in fisheries between the fishing communities in India and uh, those of our na immediate neighbors, namely Myanmar um, and um, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, our relationship with Bangladesh is, I cannot tell you how crucial it is. I cannot overemphasize it adequately. So what about, at which level are we talking now? So Bangladeshi fishermen need to talk to Indian fishermen. What about the India-Pakistan situation? Yes, so Indian fishermen, Indian Coast Guard officials at the lowest level talk to their counterparts. When we, do a, when we do a coordinated patrol with, with many of these countries, well, not Pakistan, but others, and we say that it's the core pact, which is just an abbreviation for coordinated patrol, what are we really doing? We're saying, hi, you know, there's no point in bringing this really heavy, ham-handed sort of approach to the fact that a fisherman simply strayed across some EEZ boundary or some continental shelf boundary, which he didn't even know existed. He's, he's following the fish. And so uh, maybe we shouldn't arrest them. We should just push them back. And if you do the same and I'll do the same, so that's good. But that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is solved when you actually talk to the fishermen. Since you cannot talk to the fish, actually the answer lies in talking to the fish. And the solution there is not as ludicrous as it might sound. Let me give you an example of, uh, of uh, adjacent fishing areas. You know, there's a device called aggregating device, which was used and is used with great success by Mauritius. And when I was in Mauritius, I saw how brilliantly Seychelles and Mauritius both use these. It's just a, it's just a Dan boy. It's just a Dan boy. And that Dan boy has got a set of reflectors on the, between the flag Beckett and the Dan can. And then it's got a, a set of uh, very light symbols like the ones you use in a, in, a, in a band, moving from the lower becket up to the dan can. So they put this in the water, and the upper discs, they, they uh, glint in the sunlight, and they reflect that sunlight glints onto the water. Fish are curious creatures. So epipelagic fish in particular simply go towards this, and the others hear this sound. And the sound isn't being made by some mechanical device. It's being made by the normal movement of the waves. And so the fish go there. When the fish go there, the fishermen go there. And if the fishermen have gone there, then they are not in some other location called here where we don't want them to be. How did we come up with this? Did we go to the government of India, the Ministry of Fisheries and say, or the Department of Fisheries and say, how do we solve this bullshit? We didn't do anything of the sort. We went down to the local guy and said, listen, how do you catch fish? 
And this is how he told us we catch fish. And we said, wow, we can do this. So now we can have situations in which warships leaving and entering ports that are co-located with or co-located in fishing hubs are now able to move up and down without having claims being levied one on the other that you're fouling my nets or my blades and I am cutting your nets. Does that lead to better relationships between the Navy, Coast Guard, and those fishing communities? Yep. Then what happens is that they say that these guys are pals of ours. They want to help us make money. And so if they need us to do something by telling them who's where and what the, uh, let's, uh, let's do that. Let's tell them. Rather than having an adversarial, top-down, heavy-handed approach, which is bound to only create uh, a lack of synergy between these two communities. So here I am telling you that we can go all the way down to a local fishing hamlet. And that's how Mauritius found it out. And that's how we found out. Yet, we're not able to move all the ponderous structures in the uppermost echelons to say that these solutions can be worked consistently, easily, making friends of our fishing community. So when our Coast Guard, when our Navy in India, we actually undertake, I can't tell you how many camps are undertaken per year, continuously to meet the community, to sensitize them. There's no way that we found that telling them, giving them some long lecture about national security just falls on deaf ears. But if we can make sure that in the process they are safe, we give them Toll free numbers from where we will be able to rescue them, and somebody does get rescued, and then the word spreads, then our relationship changes. We're no longer the regulatory body coming with our fancy, shiny uniforms and our huge books of regulation and the keys to the local jail. We're now coming to them and saying, Hi, we can keep you safe, we can keep you secure, we can keep you economically profitable. This is a good thing to do. And they look at you no matter what language they speak, no matter which language they speak, everybody knows very quickly who's friendly and who's not. That's the way I think we can do it. That's helpful, sir. I, I, and and I, I brought up that question is because uh, I've had conversations specifically in the ASEAN uh, area about how um, maritime criminality is often underreported because there's not enough integration of local communities understanding what to look out for uh, understanding uh, that what pathways they can do to communicate to maritime law enforcement or to national law enforcement so I think those are all interesting points about uh, a change in perspective a change in methodology and 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 issue dependent you know um, it, it's just mainly maintaining the pathways but um, we're, we're coming to the end of our time and I don't want to let you off the hook without one final difficult question. Um, and well, it may not be difficult for you, but uh, it, it, it's in essence this. Um, it, to pursue your concept, the way you understand holistic maritime security, what move or action would you recommend that both A, say the United States, a non-regional actor, take to assist in that regional um, function, um, and then also your own country of India, something that it could do that it hasn't already done, or something that it could uh, improve upon that it already does. Uh, so a two-part question there to kind, of, to kind of conclude, sir. Okay. Let me, uh, I, I, I've tried in this whole conversation to be as uh, sincere and often as blunt as I can. So I'm going to try and continue that vein until you kick me out of the, uh, of the park. And it is this. You know, governments, when they need to be involved in all these holistic structures, they need to have, and navies and all these government structures need to have little successes. And therefore, the first step that I think that needs to be done, which is already in motion, but it's kind of halting and not as smooth as it should be, is in India, for example, for the, I know this sounds like a plug for my own institution, but as I said frequently enough, uh, the National Maritime Foundation is the only uh, think tank in India that concentrates wholly upon the maritime domain. 
So you need to, if suppose, suppose we could actually develop a communication between a track one and a track 1.5 like ours, then we would automatically be able to draw in some segments of track one one, which is not track, I mean, you know, track 1.0, the real track one, and then be able to discuss and find a small solution, whether it is by way of capability enhancement or capacity building, or both, and then surrender it. Give it to the local governmental echelon and say, own it. Take credit for it. Become a big person. Take credit for the success that we hand you. Do not hold on to every small success and beat the drum with it, saying that, you know, this is us and we are so brilliant. And if you'd only spoken, because that is only going to alienate everybody. Whereas if you do it cleverly, you know, there's the old saying, Jeffrey, it says that there are more ways of skinning a cat than simply having to bludgeon it to death. And therefore, if we were to be able to, and I really mean this, you need to present government structures, government individuals, career enhancing successes that they can genuinely own and that you won't tell your friends uh, started with you. If you can do this, if you can provide little successes, then those little successes will create the ecosystem that you are seeking and lead on to big successes. Obviously, the people involved in this case, perhaps you, since you said the United States of America, and I would rather say that in the United States of America, there are a number of echelons, but let's take the military and let's take indo pacom so indo pacom seventh fleet needs to talk not just to the their oppos in uniform which they of course need to do but they also need to find these other mechanisms because the oppos in uniform are equally career enhancing they're, they're seeking career enhancement equally whereas Take a group of people, get NISA, get, um, you know, the Interpol, get the NMF, get, get all these groupings, get CNA, whoever, whatever the, whatever, whatever works for whoever. And then determine what would constitute success, little success, and then present it across, say, here, this is yours, Tom Tom it, make much of it. Present them. Because nothing succeeds like success, and success breeds success. So what kind of success am I talking about? Let's take a case where we decide that we will have a joint, a combined Indian Navy, Indian uh, and US Navy a training uh, sort of system, not of one another, but in a third country, which will genuinely benefit from both. Then present that particular success story across to your respective political political levels or bureaucratic levels and say this is you know look every naval officer in the world no matter which navy he comes from knows this he approaches the admiral and he says as the admiral was saying half his battle is there because the admiral wasn't saying anything of the sort but now if the admiral recognizes that hey this is a success story which he's presenting chances are brighter Chances are better. Uh, I probably shouldn't be saying all this, but nevertheless, that is what I think will work. And uh, I don't know, uh, it's hard for me, but let, let me give you some other examples. Let's say that we want to do, um, let's say we want to build lawfare together or mechanisms for dealing lawfare together. Let me give you a straightforward example. There is an Indian uh, underwater drone. It's in Indian waters, okay? It's just being operated. And some fisherman in Indian waters, who is an Indian, nets this particular device, this drone, this UUV, and takes it back to his village and says, hi, I got this really cool toy and gives it to his 11-year-old kid. What law has he violated? Has he violated any law? Is he to be tried for something? Is he to be tried for sedition? Is he to be tried for stealing government property? What, what is he supposed to be doing with it? 
if we could figure this out, not figure this out, if we could discuss this and say, okay, this is how it works for us. This is how it might work for you. This is how your legal structure is. It's quite different from ours, but let's go and talk to some other country. And then we can come up with a standard operating procedure and then present it to our guys and say, you know, this is what, uh, what, what we think you could, uh, you, could, you could promulgate. I think it might work. Anyway, I think it's a darn sight better option than doing more of the same. I hate this concept of more of the same. Either we are happy, Jeffrey, with where, with where we are, in which case this conversation ought not to be occurring, or we are not happy with where we are. And if we are not happy with where we are, we need to go somewhere else. And that somewhere else won't be done or won't be reached by us having more of the same. More of the same will bring us here. We are already here. So finding these different approaches is crucial to build the relationship going forward. And that, I think, is what the United States and India and everybody else, that means I'm not singling out this as a binary sort of uh, or a dyadic conversation, but everybody else needs to do. Uh, do I get a ticket to go home now? Uh, yes, sir. Um, actually, that is the perfect way to, to, to kind of uh, uh, end the conversation because, one, I agree with you. Um, and if you shouldn't maybe be saying it, then I'll get in trouble right alongside you because um, I share your, your perspective that uh, this is something success needs to be the focus. Um, progress needs to be the focus. Uh, recycling, what has always been done, is not only tedious, it's unhelpful. Um, and and, and buy-in, buy-in from the government side of things is key. Uh, and, and honestly, institutions like ours, where we're inherently evan uh, evangelists for this kind of world, because we do exist in the academic and we do exist in the official, um, I think you know, it, it falls upon us to a little bit to own that, uh, to, to be leaders in that capacity as institutions. So. Um, I will pledge Nisa to try to help, and I, and I know that we can count on the National Maritime Foundation for assistance. But um, but sir, before before I let you depart, just again my my profound thanks for your comments, uh, for your participation today, for your honesty as always, um, and do know that uh, I am like a, um, a a bug that will not die, and so you will constantly be harassed by me in future iterations of Nisa events, and I hope you will tolerate. Uh, my bothering of you in the future. Just before I leave and we close, let me once again also uh, express my own gratitude. And uh, uh, I want to tell you that a couple of things. One is that you're never going to be bothering us. So I'm afraid if bug is your uh, aspirational point, you need another one. Uh, that's never going to happen. Uh, it is always a privilege and a pleasure for the NMF in whatever capacity, and I'm not all soul about the NMF. Uh, there are other equally erudite scholars within the foundation, and our interaction with NISA has always been a hugely beneficial one to us. Uh, remember, content we can all generate, but attitude is something we really, really quite important. And uh, I think that the attitude that uh, you personally and NISA staff and uh, general bring to the table is what uh, I really, truly um, appreciate. And I want to say thank you to you for. Also for uh, all the people who are listening in and have participated in this conversation, uh, let me express my uh, gratitude for the time and the trouble you have taken. and I. I also wanted to say I hope that it has been uh, at least a moderately uh, creative and enlightening process. So thank you very much, Jeffrey. Uh, I'll hand it over back to you for closing. Thank you, sir. Um, I think I can speak for, for those in the room with us that uh, that is insightful. It always is. Um, you, uh, you never disappoint with not only being uh, uh, interesting to follow, but also uh, uh, introducing uh, cutting edge kind of ways to push the envelope. And so I appreciate that personally. So um, we're going to close out now. But again, my thanks, sir. 
Uh, more to come. I know that NISA is standing up for the next calendar year, a maritime event focused on technology. So your final point about UUVs, um, I will be coming back to you about that. So, uh, so we can put that on our calendar. Um, so uh, I will take credit for your idea because it helps me with my selling point here in the United States. So anyway, uh, fantastic. Okay, well, sir, I'm going to stop the recording now, but uh, thank you. Thank all of our uh, those who took part today, um, and we'll see you all soon. Okay, bye-bye. Take care.